Hello, everybody, and welcome back for another episode of Fundy Fridays. If you're new around these parts, my wife, the Reverend Jen, and I discuss American conservative politics and fundamentalist Christianity on this channel. And today we have a big old treat for you because we're going to roll back both of those things up into one big terrible burrito as we dive into the political mishaps of the Duggar family. Now I know that this is particularly well-tread ground for a lot of eugenonites out there right now, particularly with the release of the absolutely incredible Amazon exclusive docu-series, Shiny Happy People. And when I say incredible, I mean that because it offers the snark community a whole bunch of brand new insights into the Duggar Empire and the web of influence that they have spread throughout American religion and culture. And it certainly has nothing to do with the fact that my incredibly talented wife was a significant contributor and participant in the series, and I am offended that you would insinuate otherwise. Jokes aside, though, I cannot encourage you all enough to watch Shiny Happy People. I personally have seen it through three times now, just uh, helping Jen out with stuff. And in addition to being incredibly fascinating and informative, I just have found new information every single time I've watched. Uh, and on a subject I really thought I kind of knew pretty well. Now, don't get me wrong, it's not an easy watch. And I would encourage particular caution for any of you out there with childhood and or religious trauma in particular. Survivors of the IBLP abuse machine are given center stage in this documentary, which is the way this story really had to be told. And while these are all very important stories of struggle and recovery and triumph, they are also just as often stories of discomfort, violence, and horror. And it's totally cool if you're not into that kind of thing right now or ever. The survivors that have contributed to the series, many of whom Jen and I have gotten to know personally since the wrapping of this project, they are just some of the most exemplary and extraordinary people we have ever met in our lives. To a one, they're all scholars of deconstructed faith, public speakers of the highest caliber, and honestly, just the nicest people on earth. Hearing their stories in their words is worth the price of admission for the series, trust me. I've said this to several folks by now, but I'm going to say it to all of you, too. Shiny Happy People is the most direct and effective pushback the IBLP organization has ever received. I cannot think of any other piece of media that has held this terrible organization's feet to the fire like this. I am so proud of Jen's participation in this bro. <laughs> Sorry. I am so proud of Jen's participation in this project, and I just want to thank all of you out there who have helped put her in a position where she was able to do this, uh, and I hope that we did you proud, although I've seen what she did, and I know she did, so. <laughs> but all of that being said, as good as it is, Shiny Happy People is still just one series, right? And the production team only had about three hours to work with total, so as you might expect, a lot of stuff got left on the cutting room floor. Sadly, we may never get to see some of that stuff at all unless, I don't know, Amazon greenlights a second season of Shiny Happy People. But furthermore, I know I'm not the one to usually cover the religious oddities on this channel. That's Jen's forte, and instead I usually provide commentary on folks of a more political variety. It's a formula I respect, and it has served us very well up to this point. So why am I bringing all of this up at all? Well, here's the thing. Hidden inside the Duggar lore is a little story of political intrigue and electoral strategy, the likes of which is extremely in my wheelhouse. And since everybody seems to have Duggar analysis on the brain right now, I figured there was no better time than the present to explore this story with all of you. Also, Jen and I were both only children growing up, so you can kind of think of this as like my equal attention episode. Neither one of us has ever been great at sharing, and I want a Duggar episode too. And see, here's the thing. Olivia and the rest of the Shiny Happy People production team, they were far too busy, I don't know, righting the wrongs of the world and fighting for truth, justice, in the American way to try and shove a random story of mid-aughts election results and wasted potential into their masterwork. But me, on the other hand, pedantic nonsense is my passion, and if you've made it this far into an episode like this, I kind of suspect that you're also into getting way out into the weeds like I am. So with that in mind, today I'm going to try and break down for you the strange political career of Jim Bob Duggar, his friend and literal partner in literal crime, Jim Holt, how a certain sin in the camp toppled two political careers at once, and how maybe in some ways even changed Arkansas politics forever. 
But a couple of quick notes before we dive into everything. While the goal of today is to provide you with just a political interest piece, this story also touches on some very different and very dark elements as well. Particularly, we will be referencing the awful crimes of Josh Duggar. And unfortunately, Josh and his transgressions are just integral to this story. I would work around them if I could, but I absolutely can't. And if his presence alone is triggering for you, which I 100% get, I would turn back now. That being said, I'm not going to tread into any of the details of those crimes any more than I absolutely have to. We can't avoid Josh as part of this whole process, but we can minimize him, and that's exactly what we're going to do. His actions are only going to be discussed as necessary and in absolutely minimal detail to try and prevent as much discomfort as I possibly can. Besides, you probably already know what he did, and if you don't, honestly, at this point, good for you. For the sake of this episode, I'm going to kind of assume that you're coming in with a general understanding of the Duggars, IBLP, Bill Gothard, and particularly Josh Duggar and the scandals that surround him. If you need a more basic primer on the Duggar family, I would highly encourage you to check out Shiny Happy People, available now on Amazon Prime. That's the required reading. This is just going to be expanded universe dweeb stuff. And lastly, I swear I'm not dragging the Duggars out again just because they're all over the place in the news. I swear there is a point to all of this. While I'll be the first to admit the things I'm going to talk about today certainly aren't the most important thing for one to know about the Duggars, the story I'm going to tell is a dramatic case study into just how easily bad actors can slip into the oft-unhinged world of local and state-level politics. And y'all know I can't resist a story like that. So now that we got all that out of the way, it's time to go ahead and start the show. And like any good sweeping epic, we're going to start off with a prologue. But for that, we're going to need to go back in time about 3,400 years. Specifically, so we can get a little bit more info on the biblical side of this sin in the camp concept before we get started. No, really. At least according to Google, the Battle of Jericho started very specifically on 420-1400 BCE. So until proven otherwise, that's what I'm going with because that's funny as hell. Anyway, following the Israelite tribal army's impressive and decisive victory at Jericho in Canaan, in which they were able to break down the walls of Jericho, and thus claim the city, the entire crew was riding high, as one might imagine, after a big victorious battle. For God had blessed these soldiers with fortune in their conquest of this large city, and all seemed to be going well for the tribal armies, at least for the time being. And so with that, the Israelites and their leader Joshua set their sights on the next logical step in their conquest of Canaan, the small town of... Uh, I? I? I don't know, it's spelled A-I. How do I pronounce that? I'm sorry. I? I'm going to call it I. As it would happen, though, this battle would not go nearly as well for Joshua and the Israelites as the one in Jericho had. Despite facing even a much smaller force this time, Joshua and his army were bested and driven out of the small village of Ai with their collective tail between their legs. In a fit of despair, Joshua would blame God for the loss, specifically for not blessing his army in Ai the same way that he had blessed it in Jericho. But as you might guess, God went ahead and put Joshua in his place pretty damn quick. This, and maybe for the first time ever, I'm not sure, from the Bible, specifically Joshua chapter 7, verses 6 through 13. And Joshua rent his clothes and fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the eventide, he and the elders of Israel, and put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we had been content and dwelt on the other side Jordan? O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it, and shall environ us around, and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do unto thy great name? And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? 
Israel hath sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them. For they have ever taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen, and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you any more, except ye destroy the accursed from among you. Up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until ye take away the accursed thing from among you. Whew, that's a lot. That's right, though. Joshua's forces, once blessed by God during their battle with Jericho, saw that same blessing taken right back before the battle of Ai, because someone among the Israelite forces had sinned against God. And it was up to Joshua and his soldiers to root that sin out of the camp themselves. Long story short, it ends up being a guy named Achan. Specifically, after the battle of Jericho, in the midst of the spoils of war, he saw a nice tunic, a gold bar, and a few coins, and he decided to tuck those things away for himself, specifically hiding them in a hole in the dirt next to his tent. But apparently they were supposed to leave that stuff as like a tribute for God, which admittedly as a first time reader seemed a bit poorly explained, but what do I know? And either way, this sin in the camp that arose from Achan, well, that was the thing preventing the Israelites from receiving the blessings they needed from God to take I. And that sin had to be removed before those blessings would return. So how did Joshua and his buddies go ahead and solve the Achan problem? Well, let's check back in with Joshua 7 at verse 24. And Joshua and all of Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver, and the garment, and the wedge of gold, and his sons, and his daughters, and his oxen, and his asses, and his sheep, and his tent, and all that he had, and they brought them unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all of Israel stoned him with stones and burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. Damn, it's one thing to kill a man in front of his family, but in front of his livestock? That's just uncalled for. But what do I know? Because this heavy-handed approach worked. Immediately following Achan's death, the Lord bestowed the blessings back onto Joshua and his forces, who then immediately went back and took the small town of Ai, just as they had failed to do the first time. Everybody wins, except, I guess, the people in Jericho and the people in Ai, and also Achan. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't win at all. Now, I read a couple of Christian analysis of the story because obviously I'm a dirty heathen. Uh, and from what I saw, it seems like this story is often presented in an uplifting context, as if to say, God already knows about your sins. He knows everything. Just confess and repent and everything's fine. It's that easy. But I think there's something else we need to pay attention to here also. In the face of great sin, God is clearly willing to take back blessings he may have granted when the subject was otherwise properly pure. I'm not a biblical scholar or anything, of course, so take my analysis however you will. But just keep this story in mind as we go on. It's going to become very, very relevant very, very soon. But for now, that's enough of Bible times. We need to head back to the modern United States. And we'll start that process off with a quick overview of the natural state's political landscape up to the end of the 20th century. So it's really important to note for this story that for effectively all of the 20th century, the state of Arkansas was a strange and oddly stubborn outlier in the world of American politics. See, most of its fellow southern U.S. states had fully flipped both their local and federal political allegiances to the GOP by 1980. It seems like most of these states went red with the rise of Reagan, and then after that it just kind of stayed that way for most of them. But Arkansas stood in stark contrast to that by demonstrating a consistent willingness to split electoral tickets. Arkansas was particularly fond of things like having one senator from each of the major parties, and the same thing with governors and lieutenant governors. 
They also like to maintain heavily democratic legislative branches at the state level while being more willing to send Republicans to executive positions and flipping a district to the occasional Republican if the incumbent Democrat needed to be punished in some capacity. Giving both parties the finger during basically every major election cycle of the 20th century, that's uh, pretty cool in my opinion. But it is important to recognize that there was a dark side to this political independence too. Now I don't want to vilify a state by all means, especially when I come from one of the country's premier political wastelands. But there are just reasons to be suspicious of all the vote switching and the independent split tickets. This from Mark Carter at Arkansas Money and Politics. The last internally blue holdout in a southern sea of red, Arkansas was always something of a political puzzle. In 1968, it elected the state's first Republican governor since Reconstruction, Winthrop Rockefeller, a native New Yorker no less, strengthened another navy blue Democratic legislature, and voted to send controversial segregationist and third party candidate George Wallace to the White House. So yeah, maybe being in a free thinker and an independent voter isn't so great when it leads you to start voting for people because Richard Nixon's not racist enough for you. But regardless, the Democratic Party just, for whatever reason, held a higher degree of power in Arkansas than it did in other southern states. And it held that power for much longer than it usually would have. Particularly through the end of the 20th century, the state routinely maintained legislatures where the Democrats held a three to one advantage at a time when no other Southern state was coming even close to those ratios. The party's string of dominance would culminate in the 1992 presidential election of someone who is, I think, someone we're all familiar with. It depends upon what the meaning of the word is. Yes. When Bill Clinton, the Arkansas Democratic Party's biggest star probably ever, ascended to the presidency that he would hold from 1992 to 2000, he raised the entire party's public profile and to one of extreme national prominence at that. He was a good representative for the party at the time and he won his race in no small part based on youthful charisma. And so the party seemed to just be happy to stand off to the side and bask in his residual glow. It's been so many years now that I suspect there are a fair number of you who don't really know or remember just how much of a force of nature Bill Clinton was on the campaign trail. But his skill as a politician for things like working a crowd and connecting with the American voter, they're truly something to behold. Here, take a look at this clip if you don't believe me. Tell me how it's affected you again. Um. You know people who've lost their well, jobs, yeah. lost their homes? Uh-huh. Well, I've been governor of a small state for 12 years. I'll tell you how it's affected me. Every year, Congress and the president sign laws that makes us, make us do more things, it gives us less money to do it with. I see people in my state, middle class people, their taxes have gone up in Washington and their services have gone down, while the wealthy have gotten tax cuts. I, I have seen what's happened in this last four years when, in my state, when people lose their jobs, there's a good chance I'll know them by their names. When a factory closes, I know the people who ran it. When the businesses go bankrupt, I know them. But, as I'm sure most of you are aware as well, Bill Clinton is far from a universally beloved figure, and I am certainly not here myself to try and defend him. At this point, his lecherous creepiness towards women and his shady political persona have made him more of an uncomfortable punchline than anything else. Hey, sugar cookie. You know, legally nothing I can do counts as sex anymore. And these kinds of bad habits he was known for, well, they seem to just be particularly offensive to the sensibilities of Arkansas voters. It also didn't help that the state's next governor, Democrat Jim Guy Tucker, resigned in disgrace after being convicted of fraud for his part in the Clinton-based Whitewater real estate scandal. By the end of Clinton's time in the Oval Office, one could already see the beginnings of a big political shift on the horizon in Arkansas. For one, the state seemed to find a new political hero in the form of George W. Bush, firmly choosing him over Democratic challenger Al Gore in 2000, despite the fact that Gore was Clinton's VP. But arguably, the shifting paradigm started even before that, specifically with the replacement of the aforementioned ethically challenged Governor Tucker. See, Governor Tucker didn't want to step down, even though he had been, you know, convicted of fraud. 
and he backed out of doing so at the last minute on July 15th of 1996, citing a whole bunch of pointless technicalities in his trial. I'm not sure how much of an impact this last corrupt backstab by the state's top Democrat had on Arkansas voters, though I sincerely doubt it was a positive one. And if nothing else, it gave the Republican lieutenant governor, and at this point de facto governor, a chance to shame the hell out of Tucker on TV. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight I fully expected to address you as the 44th governor of the state of Arkansas. For nearly seven weeks, all of us have anticipated that on or before July the 15th, our governor would follow through with the promise that he made to the people of our state in late May when a jury of Arkansas citizens handed down guilty verdicts on two felony counts. The people of Arkansas understood that the governor was acting in the best interest of the people of the state when he chose to step down rather than to stay on beyond the period of time which he said would be for an orderly transition. Tonight, I come here with an extraordinary sense of probably the same shock that you have. It was all of our understanding that today was going to be the day in which the governor's announced resignation would take effect. What really is at issue tonight is a simple question between right and wrong. Yes, indeed. It seems like Arkansas had started laying the groundwork for this deep red fundamentalism influenced political transition, starting with the election of lieutenant gubernatorial candidate and noted IBLP basic course graduate Mike Huckabee. And a few hours after that speech was given, he went ahead and just dropped that lieutenant part of his title after Tucker was bullied by basically everyone in the state to resign. Which is convenient for us, because Mike Huckabee plays a pretty big part in this story. And he's particularly instrumental in the rise of our next character, one Jim Bob Duggar. In early 1997, Jim Bob, along with his wife Michelle and their at the time eight children, attended their local March for Life anti-abortion rally, similar to the one you can see on your screen here, which took place in Washington, D.C. the same year. Fun fact, the creators of Shiny Happy People managed to actually get footage from the Arkansas one because they are much better filmmakers than I am. But either way, this would prove to be a seminal moment for the entire Duggar clan, but most of all, Jim Bob himself. Reportedly, it was this event where Jim Bob first heard the Lord call out to him and tell him to run for public office. And you know, most of us might call that like uh, an adrenaline rush or a contact high or... Uh, you might even just call it having a good time at a protest. But of course, Jim Bob couldn't help himself once presented with an opportunity to stroke his own ego and decided to just label this positive experience as a literal sign from God. Thing is, though, at least in the beginning and from the outside, it kind of seemed like he might actually have been ordained by God for government work. For one, this March for Life event led to Jim Bob's first ever meeting with the aforementioned Governor Huckabee which was part of a capital tour offered with the protest, it seems. I don't know, those details are kind of hazy. Huckabee, though, not even through his first term at the time and technically never actually elected into the office he held, well, he was right on the ground floor of what would end up being a very influential, if not completely awful, political career. Likely just looking for allies and sensing a strong PR prop in the devout Duggar family, Huckabee would maintain a long and consequential relationship with the family that, for all intents and purposes, seems to continue on to this day. And Jim Bob didn't just stop with meeting and schmoozing with high-value political allies, throwing his hat into the ring for his own 5th Arkansas House District's open seat in 1998. And it's important to note that all that stuff I said earlier about Arkansas's deep blue legislature, that does not apply at all to the northwestern region of the state, or the NWA for short, Northwest Arkansas, which even in 1998 was firmly in Republican control. For reference, here is the 1998 electoral map of Arkansas for that year's Senate race, which was won by Democrat Blanche Lincoln, who will be coming up soon. But for now, I just want you to take note of that red patch in the top left corner, because that's the region we're talking about here. Even when the rest of the state went blue, these mofos would go hard red. As such, Jim Bob would cruise to victory in both his first election in 1998 against Democrat Kathy McFetridge and in his 2000 re-election effort against Democrat Joy Drummonds. 
and that would make for an overall career of four years in the Arkansas House of Representatives for the Duggar Patriarch. So what exactly did Jim Bob do in his time in the Arkansas House? I mean, besides relocating his entire giant family to temporary housing in Little Rock just so he could make things more convenient for himself, and also besides bringing all of said gigantic family to the capital for quote-unquote homeschool field trip days or something like that, which I'm sure was just a delight to all of the other representatives trying to get work done. Well, I can tell you that Jim Bob's voting record does seem to kind of be lost to time. I don't know, nobody bothered to write it down from what I can tell. I tried to find it online, but I just came up empty every single time I looked. So instead, it seems like the best way one can get a picture of Jim Bob's politics at this point would be to review all of the legislation for which he was the primary sponsor. That would mean that he took a lead role on introducing the bill to the House, and also, at least you would hope, that he had something to do with writing it. But still, that's a total of 21 bills. What kind of jackass would open 21 old, crusty, Arkansas House of Representative archive PDFs and read through them just to try and get a glimpse of what Jim Bob Duggar was up to 25 years ago. Okay, so let's break down these bills. In his first term from 1999 to 2001, Jim Bob wrote, Three bills aimed at making life easier for Arkansas auto dealers, very specifically. Can't imagine why that would be an issue of particular importance to him or anything, but I'm sure it's not like weirdly self-serving or whatever. Three abortion bills, which I think we all probably kind of expected. One bill that tries to expand access to the Arkansas State Crime Database, which I suspect is also somehow related to auto sales. And a bill to outlaw anyone under 21 years of age from becoming an exotic dancer. All of these bills died in committee, save for one which old Jibbles managed to actually get all the way to the governor's desk. Act 1106 was officially signed into law on April 5th of 1999. Now, to be fair, this is one of the super obscure auto sales bills that probably benefited only Jim Bob himself. But if you were ever an Arkansas citizen who needed to use your old license plates for a few days while finalizing transfer paperwork or something, well, then you got the Duggar dad to thank for it. Moving into his second term, though, from 2001 to 2003, it seemed like Jim Bob was ready and raring to flex some of that newfound clout he likely got winning his second election as opposed to coming into the house off of his first election. It's more impressive when you come back a second time. They probably see a lot of first-timers come through. He would author a total of 13 bills over the course of this term, and of those, these are the ones that didn't go anywhere. Three bills looking to put greater regulations on state-level legislators. Things like term limits, requiring them to forfeit and pay back their government pensions if they're ever convicted of a corruption crime, things like that. Not bad per se, but probably more performative than anything else, especially since none of the bills even got out of committee. Two more bills aimed at making life easier for Arkansas auto dealers. One more ambiguous bill that also kind of seems like it has something to do with used cars. Uh, this time it's about cashing checks. A weird property tax bill where he gave Arkansas residents like a $300 rebate and then increased taxes over the next two years to presumably pay for said rebate? It's giving Futurama Nixon. I've sent you each 300 buckaroos in the form of a tricky dick fun bill. Knock yourselves out! One really dry procedural bill relating to various rules and regulations associated with Arkansas's electrical power utilities. A bill regulating coin-operated gaming in the state, really taking a stand on those gas station video poker machines I see, and one more shot at his exotic dancer age limit bill. However, he would actually manage this time to get three of his bills signed into law, and they are as follows. An act removing the requirement of a three-hour-long safety training video course for anyone trying to acquire or renew an Arkansas driver's license. Admittedly, this is one I kind of support, at least as a guy who recently renewed his driver's license and probably wouldn't have if I had been forced to sit down and watch a three-hour movie before doing it. An act requiring Arkansas polling places to put signage at the front of their driveways. Real hard-hitting legislative action there, Jibbo, but I guess fundamentally a good idea. And an act to expand the state's income-based scholarship program to include nursing schools. Which, in my opinion, is 
tragically, actually a very good idea. So overall, while I'm sure his voting record and his co-sponsorships would be much less progressive, the sponsored legislation that he did manage to jam through was at least somewhat well-planned and maybe even a little helpful. And adding to Jim Bob's fortunes even more, the 2000 election would see him joined by longtime friend and new legislative ally, James Lonius Holt, or Jim Holt for short, because apparently the story doesn't have enough Jims already. Now, I know I said earlier that I kind of expected everybody watching this video to have at least a baseline understanding of the Duggar family, but I feel like asking you all to have an understanding of the Holt family would be a bridge way too far. So before we get into Jim and Jim's legislative adventure over here, let's just first dig a little bit farther into new Jim's backstory before we see how this all went straight to hell. FYI, I'm also going to let you all know now that because we got two Jims who kind of rotate around this story, I'm going to be referring to Jim Bob as Jim Bob, and I'm going to be referring to Jim Holt as Holt. That way I can kind of differentiate them in my brain. Now, Holt was born in the small town of Camden, Arkansas in January of 1965, and apparently relocated to the northern part of the state sometime during his childhood. From Shiny Happy People, we actually learned that this was a very difficult childhood for Holt, one where he frequently spent time away away from his home due to the abusive environment. And it just so happens that one of the places that Holt would frequent when he was away from his parents' home was a young Jim Bob Duggar's house. While Jim Bob's family was reportedly well below the poverty line, they apparently had all of the love that a young Holt had been looking for. With him even stating that Jim Bob's mother considered him to be like a second son. Father Jim has known Jim Bob for years. I met Jim Bob Duggar. He and I grew up together. We went to Shiloh Christian High School together from seventh grade on. We were going to sell books together in Kansas, uh, Bibles and encyclopedias. The struggles these two experienced together seems to have formed a long-lasting trauma bond between the two men, who, despite significant fallout with one another in recent times, seem to have held on to this friendship for far longer than I think anyone would probably expect given the circumstances. And likewise, the two young men would also develop together in their faith. They both attended Shiloh Christian Academy in Springdale, Arkansas. They went to church together, and they even both attended their first IBLP basic course together. These two may not have been blood kin, but by all appearances, they were about as close as two human beings can get and were already basically brothers. In my research, the differentiation between the two as people didn't really seem to show up until after they had both graduated high school. Jim Bob graduated with an immediate eye for employment, spurning higher education in favor of taking independent jobs like auto and real estate sales right out of high school. He would also marry young on Michelle Duggar's 18th birthday, in fact, and when he himself was only 19 years old. In contrast, Jim's own love story with his own wife, Bobby Berenberg Holt, starts off even more uncomfortable somehow than I married her on her 18th birthday. Now, Holt started out a bit later on the romantic front than his buddy Jim Bob, taking the more common approach of dating at 19 instead of just skipping straight to the marriage part. But Jim made up for this more normal approach to dating in his own spectacularly creepy way. In Shiny Happy People, we learn that Jim and Bobby Holt's relationship began when she was only 14 years old, in contrast to Jim, who was 19 at the time. You know, just in case you were starting to think he was less trash than Jim Bob or something. But they would eventually marry around 1987, and in the 80s, getting married just kind of seemed to override all of the other ick, it would seem, and people just stopped paying attention. Jim Holt also took a more worldly approach to his post-secondary life than Jim Bob as well, at first pursuing a traditional college education at the University of Maryland. There are no reports that he graduated, though, and I will say that it's generally very hard to find any information about this part of Jim Holt's life. Hell, I had to verify where he went to college on LinkedIn. But just put a pin in that for now, because we'll get to that in a little bit. See, in fact, though, most of the stories you read about Jim Holt tend to jump straight from his childhood to 1987, when he enlisted with the U.S. Army. 
Jim really wanted folks to know about this military background, particularly in his electoral days, and that's for good reason, because if it's to be believed at least, it's admittedly pretty impressive. We can see in an archived bio from Jim Holt's 2010 campaign website the kind of clandestine operations he managed to get himself involved in. Jim was born in Camden, Arkansas, and was reared in northwest Arkansas. He joined the military in 1987 and served in the U.S. Army Joint Intelligence Operations at the National Security Agency under the presidencies of Ronald Reagan, George Bush, and Bill Clinton. Jim was involved in highly classified operations during the Cold War, the ousting of Noriega from Panama, and Operation Desert Storm. Yes, you heard that right. Jim was apparently involved in everything from the Cold War to Desert Storm, even the ousting of the infamously violent Panamanian dictator Manuel Noriega. I'm talking Noriega, Noriega, Noriega. And bear in mind, Noriega was ousted in 1989, just two years after Jim enlisted with the service at all. The Cold War is generally agreed to have ended in 1989 and absolutely no later than 1991, and likewise Desert Storm was completely over by 1991. And I mean, at least according to the man's own bio, he was involved in all three of these operations within a span of just about four years. <laughs> Jason born in a manger over here, am I right? So, given that kind of military background, it's really no surprise that Jim sort of falls off the face of the earth for this period of his life, especially with all of the top-secret black ops he was apparently working on. We do know that sometime between his retirement from the military in the year 2000, Jim reports owning some undisclosed businesses, we don't really know much about them, and he also reported some work as a part-time biblical counselor at this point in his life. Now, unlike Jim Bob, we don't have any real evidence to say what exactly pushed Jim Holt to take a jump into politics? We do know that the IBLP just generally encourage men to take leadership roles in their family, their community, basically wherever they can find them, and has attempted to spread its political influence in the past by getting some of its graduates and people into public office. But of course we don't know if any of that had an effect on Jim in particular. No matter what the motivation was for Holt though, he certainly had every reason to make the jump into politics. He and Jim Bob both shared several qualities qualities that made them strong candidates, at least in their part of the country, and if you didn't dig too far. The light, affable Ozark accent that captures the friendliness of a southern drawl without losing any authoritative force. The kind of square-jawed, trustworthy face of a 1950s sitcom dad that seems to just lull American voters straight into a false sense of security about even the worst candidates' political motivations and the exceptionally devout Christian backgrounds demanded of them by voters in this particularly conservative region of northern Arkansas. But Jim Holt had even more going for him than Jim Bob did. That military record would give him a much broader appeal in a higher election, and especially over Jim Bob the used car salesman, which tends to not be a job with a lot of public trust. Side by side, and without any further knowledge of their backgrounds, I think most people would choose Jim Holt to be the likely more influential politician based on his resume alone. And so in 2000, just two years after Jim Bob, Jim Holt would toss his hat into the ring for the open seat in his Arkansas 5th House District. Notably, this district shares a significant border with Jim Bob's 6th District, and, in fact, both men lived in Springdale at the time, seemingly because Springdale contained parts of both of their districts. Unlike Jim Bob, though, Jim Holt didn't even have a Democratic challenger at all and simply just had to get through the Republican primary and he'd have the seat outright. He did so, but by the skin of his teeth, with a victory margin of just 12 votes. Please remember that next time you feel like not voting. Still, rocky start aside, Jim Holt's greater ambition and skill as a legislator as compared to Jim Bob became pretty apparent almost immediately after his arrival to the House. Despite Jim Bob's one-term head start, Holt was here to make it clear that he was the one to keep your eye on. For one, Jim Holt introduced 12 House bills in his first term as compared to Jim Bob's eight in the same time frame. And what's more, his bills, at least on my reading, were more varied and ambitious than those by Jim Bob, honestly, in either of his terms. 
Now, once again, we don't seem to have any evidence of Jim Holt's voting record or um, anything really like that. So these bills are probably, again, the best way for us to get an idea of what Jim's politics and outlook were like back at this point. But for real, he has like 12 bills to go through. And like, I mean, okay, I get it for Jim Bob Duggar, right? But what kind of absolute loser would crack open 12 PDFs from 25 years ago just to find out what Jim Holt was up to? Okay, so just like before, we'll start out with the stinkers. Jim Holt's losing bills were as follows. Three general logistic and appropriations bills, the kind of stuff that makes the world go round, but also demonstrates an understanding of the legislative and state budgeting processes. Three bills with a particular focus on the treatment and education of minors, which seems to have been a platform plank of sorts for Jim Holt. These included a bill preventing the sale of media and materials containing nudity or graphic violence to individuals under 18, which seems likely to be misinterpreted and misused, but I guess isn't fundamentally a bad thing, I don't know. A bill requiring express written permission from parents for their kids to attend sex education classes of any kind, which is just totally and outright a fundamentally bad thing. And a strange resolution urging the federal Congress to remove restrictions around special education, which in my opinion is just friggin' weird. And beyond that, we had one more bill to try and force certain Arkansas counties to accept earlier cutoff dates for changes of address on voter registration forms, which sounds boring, but I'll admit it seems kind of prescient and kind of looks like the modern Republican trend of targeting voter turnout. And lastly, one random bill removing restrictions on the usage of auto dealership license plates. Like if you've ever seen a car with plates that say dealer, that kind of thing. What is it with these guys and used car regulations? Oh, uh, yeah. Jim Holt also managed to get three bills signed into law while he was part of the House, as opposed to Jim Bob's one bill. Act 1273, establishing a governor's award for lawyers who provide pro bono adoption services that, at least according to my research, appears to have never actually been awarded to anyone. Act 1524, granting the surviving spouses of veterans to keep getting veteran-only license plates. A kind gesture, but kind of seems like a PR move too, if we're being honest. And Act 1830, a long and meandering treaties covering the most minute details of removing abandoned vehicles from Arkansas public land. Which, all I have to say is, why? There's people that are dying, Jim. But beyond all of these bills, there is one that Holt is most known for during his time as a state representative, and that is House Bill 2548. The title of that bill reads as follows. HB 2548, an act to prohibit state agencies and other public entities from using tax dollars to purchase or distribute material that they know or should have known, contains or presents as factual information which has been proven false or fraudulent. Well, that on its face sounds pretty reasonable. I mean, schools should be teaching kids that only facts are in fact facts. But as we all know by now, American politicians rarely, if ever, say things are the way they actually are. So what is this bill, really, and why is it the most famous piece of legislation with Jim Holt's name on it? Well, that's because he's talking about Darwinism. Yes, this is how Jim Holt decided to debut his own particular brand of political and religious weirdness to the world and the voters of Arkansas taking a massive and oddly intense stand against evolution in schools like it was the 1940s. Even more unbelievable, while this bill was soundly defeated on the House floor, it still managed to get itself out of committee, and that's after Holt brought in, of all people, Dr. Dino Kent Hovind himself to testify on its behalf. And in some regards, this bill was just a run-of-the-mill, we-don't-really-know-what-happened, mealy-mouthed, kind of defensive intelligent design bill that was more common in the George W. Bush years. But Holt was not afraid to let his zealotry shine through, either. He wanted to make sure the world knew that there was a pro-evolution conspiracy in our schools, filling our textbooks with fraudulent claims, and silencing innocent young Earth Christians. As you know, in 2001, I introduced a bill 
And it really didn't talk about evolution. It did specifically talk about it as far as different evidences that demanded um, that substantiates that theory of evolution. As far as introducing that nationwide, Bill, I just want the truth to get out there. I, the bill that I put forward said this, the evidences in our textbooks are hoaxes. And I said, look, let's clean up the textbooks. Is there some textbooks? There are some teachers that don't know that these evidences have been proven false. We are actually forced to teach evolution in schools. I think we have to be able to speak the truth. That's what makes America great, is our freedom to say, yes, I do believe in God. And yes, I do think he created this earth. And yes, I do believe he created the universe. You know, for hundreds of years, that was commonly accepted practice. Oh, and you remember how I told you to put a pin in that whole Jim Holt went to college thing earlier? Well, here's where it becomes relevant again, because the only time, and I mean the only time Jim Holt references his time at the University of Maryland is when he can use it to prove that he's a smart brain big boy who can totally disprove evolution, you guys. And I was a science major and never did I ever, my faith had anything to do with starting this evolutionary bill. Uh, what happened was is I was went to critical thinking analysis school in the military and by the time I got to college I about drove my professors nuts because I said, okay, this theory doesn't line up with this law, this hypothesis doesn't line up, so there's got to be some answer here because at one time I actually believed in evolution. And let's show you once more where he does it in a speech from 2010. And this time he just goes ahead and upgrades himself to a pre-med major because why not? When I first ran for office in 2000, uh, they would make fun of me because I ran a bill in 2001 that said these are the false evidences in our textbooks of evolution. And I was a science and pre-med major in college. So I just wanted to get that information out there and I said, you know, these are the things that they're saying in our textbook, that textbooks that even the scientific community themselves have said these are false. These are false evidences. And if you take away those evidences, there's no pillar for, for evolution. I was a, I used to be an evolutionist, but... Yeah, sure, Jim. Your 15 credit hours of human anatomy and that one macroevolution seminar I'm sure you slept through, that totally qualifies you to undo years and years and years of scientific research. I was a science and pre-med major in college. You've got a degree in baloney. <laughs> Moving back to politics, though, it's at this point where we'd see Jim Holt take a decidedly different approach to the process than Jim Bob. For one, instead of rerunning for his House seat, Jim would decide in 2002 to make a run at the more prestigious Arkansas State Senate. Running in his own local 35th Senate district, Holt was able to take a close but convincing victory over Democrat Winford Phillips, taking the seat and becoming a state senator. Now, during his time in the Arkansas State Senate, which, bear in mind, was four years long, Holt would be the primary sponsor of 33 bills, in addition to 12 House bills that he was also a primary sponsor on. And once again, we don't have a voting record to be found, so this is kind of all we have to really dig into his politics. But I'm serious. I ask you all, what kind of unhinged, depraved, ungodly megadork would read 45 archived Arkansas State Senate PDFs just to get a little bit better view of Jim Holt's politics. Nah, I got you that time. I didn't do that. I, I think by now we all have a pretty good idea of Jim Holt's politics and don't need to read any more bills. Suffice to say, I skimmed over him and he sent a lot of procedural spending bills through, peppered with some weird educational ones, like trying to make sure that students get the full transcript of historical documents or trying to shift power away from the State Department of Education back to local school boards. Instead, though, of reading the bills, we're reaching a point in our story where the gyms were starting to look beyond just local or even state-level office. Before 2002, highly controversial fundamentalist beliefs like they carried, those may have been a full-stop deterrent to seeking office at the federal level. But by this point in Arkansas's history, it seems like those rules didn't apply anymore. Arkansas had even demonstrated a willingness by this point to put far-right candidates into high-level federal offices, electing hardline conservative Tim Hutchinson to the U.S. Senate in 1996. 
They followed this up by formally electing Mike Huckabee in 1998 for the first time, instead of just putting him there because the other guy went to jail. This state was by all outside appearances at least, primed and ready to put some fierce conservatives into top positions. And these grifters were more than ready to take advantage. So moving into the 2002 election cycle, Arkansas was in a position that it liked to be in, namely having one senator from each major political party. In 2002, it was Republican Tim Hutchinson's turn to face re-election, and in 2004, it would be Democrat Blanche Lincoln's turn. Now, for an up-and-coming GOP religious hardliner, the choice here is probably pretty obvious, or at least it should have been. While, yes, Hutchinson was weaker than usual at this point due to a very public and very messy divorce, it's still just generally considered unwise for anyone to try and primary out an incumbent candidate in good party standing. Any serious contender at the time would have likely been eyeing up a run against Blanche Lincoln in 2004, and this is the approach Jim Holt decided to take following his state senate victory in 2002. But apparently, the Lord Almighty doesn't really care about sound political strategy. Once again, commanding Jim Bob Duggar to take bold and decisive political action, this time against the vow-breaking Hutchinson. Although at that point, from a voter's perspective, it would have been hard to say that Jim Bob was substantially different than Hutchinson in any regard. So this move made especially no sense. This 2001 quote from journalist Kane Webb at the Weekly Standard. Jim Bob may be the only living politician to the right of Tim Hutchinson, and according to the National Journal's congressional vote ratings, there's nobody farther to the right than the senator from Arkansas. I mean, I guess one could theoretically interpret this as a desperate attempt by Jim Bob to not get outshone by his running buddy, but you'd have to be, like, super cynical to think that. But more importantly, this was a huge moment in IBLP history any way you would slice it. That organization now had two successive candidates lined up for U.S. Senate elections in Arkansas in both 2002 and 2004 now. And if either one of those guys managed to get anywhere in their elections, the IBLP would end up with a massive new national platform with a chance to take their beliefs nationwide in a way that they had never been before. And given the state's political trends at the time, what once might have been considered a pair of long-shot candidates were now in position to be potential contenders, maybe. I can only imagine that, at least in some regards, this moment in time was the highest of highs for both men. But, as I'm sure a lot of you have figured out by now, this time also coincided with a series of terrible crimes and escalating lies. And ultimately, the revelations that would come up between these two men and their families would also end up playing a significant role in their shared political downfall, I think. And so, for better or worse, it is now time for us to talk about the sin in the camp. So at this point, I think one way you could reasonably describe the Sin in the Camp story was as kind of a fundy snark urban legend. It's a story that was appearing on early snark message boards, and since that time it's been told and retold in a long-spanning game of telephone. To the point now where oftentimes you'll find whole groups of people talking about it where no one truly knows what's being referenced. Some folks insisted that the phrase was uttered by Jim Bob, while others would insist that Jim Holt said it. Some said it was uttered in 2002, others said it was uttered in 2003. While everyone did seem to be aware that the quote-unquote sinner of the story was Josh Duggar, there were disagreements about which of his many sins were actually being referenced here. Was it inappropriate behavior towards his sisters, or was it the use of pornography on Jim Holt's campaign computers? Well, it seems like as of June 2022, we finally got a definitive answer, thanks to an interview conducted with the Holts by the Sojo Files podcast. Let's listen to Jim Holt tell the story himself here. 
So in May of 2002, we were at the watch party and the reporter asked, he to said, you said that you felt like God had called you to run this race. And I'm, I'm paraphrasing, it's not verbatim. But the reporter said, doesn't that mean there is the connotation that if God tells you to run, that you're supposed to win? He's like, and you thought you were supposed to win. Now, this is conversation is to Jim Bob, right? Right. Yeah. And he said, so how can you, can you explain why? You wouldn't win. That you didn't win. And Jim Bob kind of looks off to the side. And I remember this like it was yesterday. He looks off, he goes, sit in the camp. Or sit in the camp. Now, as much as I was happy to have this clip, and it certainly is a bombshell of a statement, I will acknowledge that the show host's friendliness with the Holtz at some points in this episode made me a little uneasy, but in many regards, this is an episode all about giving credit where it's due, and I have to admit that it seems like this podcast is where this important Fundy Snark rumor was finally put to bed. But the other event that's referenced sometimes as the sin in the camp is much more influential to the overall arc of this story than the one just discussed. In fact, it's likely the defining moment of this entire saga. And so we would be remiss if we didn't bring it up. But this is another moment that involves Josh, so I want to give another quick trigger warning heads up. And again, I'm going to remind everyone we're going to be using general terms here. And for a more comprehensive overview of the Josh Duggar story, I'm once again going to refer you to Shiny Happy People on Amazon Prime. So, on March 30th of 2003, Jim Bob and Michelle Duggar informed Jim and Bobby Holt of the inappropriate behaviors that Josh had perpetrated against his sisters. Even as just friends and political allies, this would be an earth-shattering revelation that one would expect to alter the course of a relationship forever. But when we add in the fact that Josh Duggar was actively courting the Holt's oldest daughter at the time with the intent for marriage, well, with that, it becomes a cataclysm big enough to swallow both of these families whole. And please, bear in mind that Josh and the Holt's oldest daughter were both 14 years old at the time of this pseudo-betrothal, adding a layer of uncomfortable marriage arrangement on top of an already bleak situation. Now, obviously, this was significant information that should have been brought to everyone's attention immediately. Yet all signs indicate that the Duggars held on to this secret for years before telling anyone likely in large part as a means of protecting their ever-expanding public profile. In Shiny Happy People, they even indicate that Jim Bob and Michelle had not planned to tell the Holtz at all, and instead were expecting for Josh to make this a wedding night confession to their daughter. And in all my research, I couldn't find anything that was a concrete catalyst for what changed the Duggars' minds and made them report this. Though with the timing, I suspect that Jim Holt's upcoming Senate run in 2004 might have been one of the catalysts. But even beyond all of that, recent revelations from both Shiny Happy People and other sources indicate that Jim Bob not only held on to this horrible secret for years, but actively and consistently lied to the Holtz and others about Josh's treatment and consequences for this as well. Jim Bob would make a big show out of driving Josh and Jim Holt all the way to Little Rock to turn Josh into the state troopers. But what he didn't inform Jim Holt of at the time was that the trooper he would speak with was a longtime family friend who appeared to have no interest in arresting or prosecuting Josh for this. Which, given what we found out about that officer later, now makes tragically perfect sense. Likewise, in recent interviews, the Holtz have indicated that they demanded Josh not only be prosecuted for this, but also placed into an appropriate treatment program. And at least according to the Holtz, they weren't the only ones telling the Duggars to do this either. And while Jim Bob acted like he had placed Josh into a reputable treatment program, he had actually sent him to what was essentially an IBLP reformatory work camp with no structure. Josh would spend his time in this program building houses, but otherwise receiving no direct treatment for his behaviors. 
This flimsy ass program even allowed Jim Bob to check Josh out, supposedly for Jim Bob's birthday, but what was in reality a very important family interview with Parents Magazine. So in reality, while the sin in the camp really does seem to relate to a specific time and place in this story, and was likely just a phrase uttered by Jim Bob himself that had nothing to do with the Holtz, the greater idea of biblical sin in the camp definitely comes to mind. If we recall our story from earlier in the episode, I particularly think we can see this metaphor starting to take shape. I would argue that Jim Bob acted much like Aiken hiding the ill-gotten gains of his neglected familial life and his successful public persona in the dirt, away from God and everyone, so as to try and keep both of those things going without facing the ramifications of what was really going on in his home. His recklessness and selfishness put the entire camp in danger, not just himself. But where the biblical Joshua rooted the sin out of his camp and thus restored the blessings of God to his armies, it would seem that Jim Holt in particular just did not have the spine to do what needed to be done. Jim Holt may have been misled, and sure, he does seem to have immediately ended his daughter's courtship with Josh Duggar, which is like the barest of bare minimums. But rather than forcing the point and holding Jim Bob accountable for his lies or Josh accountable for his atrocities, it would seem that Holt was comfortable to just assume his friend was telling the truth and look the other way, rather than making sure Josh faced any proper or positive consequence. Personally, I can't help but wonder if Jim Holt stopped caring once his daughter was out of the courtship which likely would have taken his family out of the immediate blast radius while still leaving all of those Duggar girls in the house to suffer with Josh. Holt's appearance in the Duggar's 2004 14 Kids and Pregnant Again special would also seem to indicate that his family had patched up with the Duggars at some point, especially since Josh is a prominent feature in this entire thing. Okay, yeah, and sure. Now, in Shiny Happy People, Holt claims that he never wanted to do this interview in the first place and he didn't know it was happening and yada, 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 all that nonsense. But at the same time, his family's appearance made it to TV, including a significant number of interactions between his children and Josh Duggar. Would TLC have put that on television without the requisite paperwork? I don't think so. And I think Jim Holt signed all of it. And besides, none of that explains this photo and post from 2013. So if we again turn to the lessons of our Bible, I think we can all put together by now just how well these political conquests are going to go for these men. God has no place for the spineless condonement of sin in his army. And those who don't show proper resolve in their faith may very well lose the blessings that were once granted to them. And by now, if I've done my job right, you all should be chomping at the bit to watch these men crash, burn, and fail. So, let's see just exactly how they did that. Jim Bob was the first to tumble and fall his way right the hell out of Arkansas state politics, eating an absolutely humiliating loss to Hutchinson in the 2002 Senate primary. Who boy, that is bad. Hutchinson was fundamentally supposed to be weaker than he'd ever been before, even against other Republicans. But it seems that Hutchinson may have gotten a little bit of divine intervention in the form of one Mark Pryor a beloved local figure and political dynasty child as the son of Arkansas State Rep, Senator, and Governor David Pryor. Notably, it was actually Tim Hutchinson who replaced the elder Pryor when he was elected to the Senate in 96. Mark Pryor's entrance in this race turned it from the story of a weakened Republican incumbent on shaky ground into a monumental affair between two diametrically opposed but equally revered Arkansas political dynasties. At this point, it was now a big money brawl where name recognition was everything. And this was at a time where Jim Bob had none of that which led to him being quickly cast aside in favor of the new shiny prize fight on the way. 
Hutchinson would ironically end up losing the Senate general election to Pryor, making the whole thing feel just that much more of a moot point for Jim Bob. And it's not even like Pryor was that great of a candidate either. At this point, he's a centrist has-been who is most famous for being embarrassed embarrassingly upset in 2014, and ironically for being the butt of a joke in the insufferable Bill Maher film Religious due to his lack of belief in evolution. Do you believe in evolution? You know, my, I, first, I don't know. Um, you don't have to pass an IQ test to be in the Senate, though. Truthfully, though, I doubt that Jim Bob was very worried about any of this at this point. By this time in his life, he had already started transitioning from Arkansas state political figure to budding reality TV star and cultivating his ever-important relationship with TLC. Hey, everybody. Uh, so, editing note, I just realized I missed Jim Bob Duggar's 2006 run for office against Bill Pritchard. Um, it's not, like, super important or anything, but, interestingly enough, he did only lose that 2006 run by 200 votes. So, once again, if you're ever thinking about not voting, remember that. That would come to form the cornerstone of his life, his public profile, and his finances. He simply traded formal political power for informal social power, and I expect he got a good exchange rate on that, too. Now, moving into 2004, we can see that Jim Holt's loss to Democratic incumbent Blanche Lincoln was certainly more graceful than Jim Bob's primary destruction. But Holt was by no means any more victorious than Jim Bob in trying to take down his political foe either. And fundamentally, looking back on this election now, it looks less like an up-and-coming GOP star taking down a stodgy old Democratic stalwart, and more like a conservative wackadoo just getting his shot because nobody wanted to face the juggernaut in front of him. Lincoln was popular both with the state's voters and its big-money donors. She already had a big national profile, and... Honestly, she was fully expected to win no matter who the challenger was. Furthermore, Lincoln was well-versed in how to communicate with her constituency, speaking carefully in a way that minimized Jim's appeal while highlighting her own democratic centrism and socially conservative views. Earlier, we took a look at a clip from Jim in that 2004 debate. But take a listen here as Lincoln takes her very first question. Why, or why not, should there be a federal constitutional amendment defining marriage as between a man and a woman? Well, this is an issue that um, has been talked about a great deal in this election. And um, it's interesting, because my opponent and I don't really disagree on the substance of that issue. I do oppose gay marriage. I oppose the same-sex marriage. And I do so based on my faith and my religion. It's very important to me in the way that I was brought up and cer certainly my biblical teaching. And I do believe that marriage should only be between a man and a woman. It's a, marriage is instituted by God and, and uh, again, should only be between a man and a woman. But I think it's important for us to realize that domestic laws have always been dealt with by our states, whether it's marriage or divorce, whether it's adoption or whether it's child custody. And we've taken great precautions in this country. The federal government in 1996 through the Defense of Marriage Act encouraged states to establish their own laws in this area. They said that the federal government did view marriage as between only a man and a woman, but encouraged states to, to use their own laws. Now, yes, obviously that kind of talk for a Democrat would be an absolute career killer today. But in 2004, carefully navigating the line between I don't support the gays personally and a federal amendment is a really stupid idea was a vital part of campaigning as a Southern Democrat. And while Jim Holt was an okay speaker and politician with the right values and background to get federal office in Arkansas, he clearly just could not keep up with Blanche Lincoln's incredible talent for pandering. Lincoln herself would end up becoming the ultimate victim of her own conservatism when she lost her 2010 election, as the consistently friendly relationship she maintained with the Senate GOP for years finally did her in. There was also the embarrassing release of this leaked conversation between Blanche and two of her more progressive friends about the gay community. You really haven't grasped the concept of this gay thing yet, have you? There must be homosexuals who date women. Yeah, they're called lesbians. Sorry, couldn't resist Blanche Blanche, you know how it is. Now, moving back to Jim, though, interestingly enough, this moment and loss were not 
actually the technical end of his political career. See, Arkansas doesn't have a law that says you have to step down from one elected office before pursuing another one like some other states do. And as such, after his loss to Blanche Lincoln, Jim Holt was able to just go right back to his state senate seat and finish out the last two years of his term. But the conclusion of that state senate term for Jim Holt in 2006 would mark the last time that either of the Jims held public office, which is probably the most uplifting thing I've gotten to say throughout the entire course of this episode so far. Don't get too excited, though. These two still had plenty of fuel in their political tanks left, even if they no longer had any official power, and we'll go ahead and explore that part now. Now, in 2006, Jim Holt, for one, was coming out of a relatively respectable loss to a strong incumbent senator. And that's not even to mention his relatively successful term in the state senate. In 2006, at least, the Holt name still carried a little bit of political weight in Arkansas. Holt would capitalize on this by throwing his hat into the ring for the 2006 lieutenant gubernatorial race, and convincingly took the primary with 56% of the overall vote. Which then immediately stopped mattering at all once he got trounced by the Democrat Bill Halter in the general election. The Democrats would also take the gubernatorial race that year as Democrat Mike Beebe would defeat Asa Hutchinson, brother of Tim, to make the entire Arkansas gubernatorial office blue, at least for that moment in time. And then Beebe would lose to Asa in 2015 because apparently there's only like five actual politicians in Arkansas. Now, Jim would take a different tack coming out of this lieutenant gubernatorial loss, starting a feud with, of all people, Mike Huckabee. He would blast Huckabee in the media for things like being too soft on immigration. He would attack Huckabee's followers for not being properly Christian. And he would write scathing editorials like this one he wrote for the Northwest Arkansas News in 2008. If I told you that Mike Huckabee has raised more taxes, grown more government, supported more bureaucratic control of our schools, pardoned more criminals, helped bring in more illegal immigrants, and been more duplicitous in 10 years than Bill Clinton was in 12, would you feel betrayed? He can talk all he wants, but his record is who he is. Hey everybody, this is James in editing. So uh, Jen and I were checking it back and uh, we both noticed that... Um, it's just kind of odd, and I didn't mention this in the video at the time, but I wanted to mention it here, that while Jim Bob was campaigning for Mike Huckabee's presidential campaign, Jim Holt was going on these tirades against him in the news. And I just think that's interesting. I wonder what was going on there, and I wanted to mention it to you all to kind of put it on your brain. And because I'm sure picking on longtime party stalwarts is a great way to win friends and influence people, Jim would go ahead and throw his hat into the ring for the U.S. Senate one more time in 2010, where he would lose the primary in such humiliating fashion that he would never run for office again. In all honesty, it seems like this is the moment where all of Jim Holt's political influence finally died off entirely. But in contrast, coming out of 2006, Jim Bob was flying high on the back of a TV deal with TLC that proved to be more and more lucrative as time went on. In addition to the financial windfall that these shows were providing the Duggar family, they also got far more public exposure than they ever did throughout Jim Bob's political career, and that exposure was much more positive Positive as well. Jim Bob maintained his close relationship with Mike Huckabee over the years, and particularly acted as a very important campaign supporter and surrogate during Huckabee's 2008 presidential run. Jim Bob would also end up performing a similar supporter surrogate function for Rick Santorum in 2012. He also has the support of Christian conservative reality TV star Jim Bob Duggar, who's driving the Santorum bus across Iowa. Duggar backed caucus winner Mike Huckabee in 08. He's urging evangelical voters to rally behind Santorum now. He has a proven track record. He's a Christian conservative that uh, has, has just always stood for what's right. The Chuck truck. In general, though, while Jim Holt seemed to desperately cling to the electoral success he once had while not actually being able to replicate it anymore, Jim Bob instead pivoted very smoothly into his new life as a reality TV star, and because of that, he got to keep some of his clout. So basically, instead of being stoned and lit on fire, Aiken just took his gold bar and fucked off in the middle of the night while no one was watching, but again, 
None of the people in this story are exceptionally good or smart people, and Jim Bob's comically large ego would rear its head in a new and decidedly political way, which would end up leading to his own downfall. Namely, the attempted promotion of his dipshit sons as viable political figures as a weird attempt to extend his already tainted political legacy. Hey pal. You just blowing from stupid town? So to start off, it's pretty obvious to most of us by now that Josh inherited a lot of traits from his father, not the least of which was just unmitigated gall. As we can see by his continued insistence on taking public facing roles while also working a separate full-time job, keeping the skeletons in his closet from escaping. Josh supposedly ran his own political consultation business in 2007, and bear in mind that at that time he would have been an undereducated 19 year old with absolutely no political experience. That was probably just, I don't know, telling candidates, get more votes or something. He, like his father, would also take formal roles and engagements with the 2008 and 2012 presidential campaigns of Mike Huckabee and Rick Santorum disrespectively before culminating his political career with a period of service as the chairman for FRC Action, the political engagement wing of the Family Research Council, from 2013 to 2015. This job produced particularly a metric ton of clips that just nowadays look surreal when you know what ended up happening with Josh. My favorite has to be this one, though, where he tries to play pretend like he's a real politician while also hawking some random low-budget Christian movie at the same time. Hello, I'm Josh Duggar from TLC's 19 Kids and Counting. I'm also the Executive Director of Family Research Council Action here in Washington, D.C., where we are advancing faith, family, and freedom. Well, my family, like yours, is grateful for those who produce family-friendly entertainment that is not only uplifting, but teaches the timeless principles and Christian character that are often so scarce in the entertainment field today. That's why I'm excited to tell you about Alone Yet Not Alone. Alone Yet Not Alone is uplifting and inspiring. It grips the viewer and encourages you to look beyond yourself and to invest in what matters, your relationship with God, family, and serving others. The quality portrayal of this remarkable story of faith, hope, and love reinforces good moral character and principles along with a spectacular cinematic experience. I hope your family enjoys Alone Yet Not Alone, and I hope you'll share this with your friends and family. God bless you. Oh, and fun fact, the uh, filmmakers still have this endorsement up on their YouTube channel for some reason. But for real, FRC Action is a legitimately powerful organization with connections to many, many Republican lawmakers and policies. This group consistently and effectively has advocated for anti-choice, anti-LGBTQIA+, and anti-immigration causes. Josh likely got in over his head even just taking this job at all. And that was even before the now infamous 2015 In Touch article detailing his crimes against his sisters, which led to not only his immediate resignation from FRC action, but also to his new life as an abject social pariah. But if there is one thing Jim Bob Duggar has access to, it's more children, and specifically more audacious boys who think they're qualified for public office, despite all evidence to the contrary. And this time, it would be young Jedediah Duggar's turn. Like Josh, Jed had demonstrated a long-running interest in electoral politics. He and his sister Joanna would serve as capital interns in Arkansas in 2017, and then Jed would additionally intern in 2018 with the successful Bob Ballinger for Arkansas Senate campaign. And hey, one more time, James in editing, um, this is crazy. So I didn't realize when I was doing this, Jen pointed it out to me later, that Bob Ballinger is... Uh, Joy Duggar and Austin Forsyth's brother-in-law. Um, so this is definitely kind of a nepotism thing, um, which admittedly puts the whole uh, campaign manager thing for Jed into perspective. Now I have to say, Jed has in some materials referenced himself as a campaign manager for that Ballinger campaign. I, I can't say it didn't happen, but he was also 20 with no experience, so take it how you will. Now, supposedly, this was also the time where Jed started to lay his own groundwork for a run at the Arkansas State House in 2020. And I say supposedly because a lot of that material seems to have disappeared from the candidate, likely due to Jed's 
overwhelmingly low appeal. Whispers and legends on the internet tell of a 2019 podcast that Jed appeared on that, by all accounts, should have been the safest possible place for him to talk politics. It was even hosted by one of the sons of the family that took Josh Duggar in when he was out on bond from prison in 2022. If you can get any more Duggar friendly than that, I don't know how. But apparently, at least according to some of the sources I found on the internet, even this softball interview was so rough for Jed that it just could not be left to public scrutiny. Comments I read on various Reddit threads indicated that Jed struggled to keep up with even the most basic of political topics, which would surprise me given what I've heard from him in the past. But it seems like Jed came out of this experience, as all IBLP men do after being confronted with their shortcomings and flaws, and simply went ahead named Hire. All of this would snowball into the announcement of a 2020 run for the Arkansas 89th District House seat by Jed. Hello District 89, this is Jed Duggar, running to be your next state representative. I've grown up in the Springdale area all my life and am a local small business owner. I understand the important issues facing the residents and businesses of Springdale. As your next state representative, I will fight for sound economic policies, push for more tax relief for all Arkansans, and advocate for conservative values. I'm a Christian and I will stand up for religious liberties. I'm pro-life and I will be an advocate for the unborn, and I will always defend our Second Amendment. With your prayer, support, and help, I look forward to serving you as a strong conservative voice in Little Rock. This would pit Jed against Democratic incumbent Megan Godfrey, a stellar political figure who was so overqualified to run against Jed that it's downright embarrassing. For reference, Godfrey had already won a dark horse race in 2018 to flip her seat blue, the first time it had gone to a non-Republican in almost 20 years. She was also a teacher specializing in English as a second language programs in the region of Arkansas that featured more English as a second language students than any other. She was also a wife, mother, and PhD candidate because as a Democrat in 2020 Arkansas, you really had to run up the score. Let's contrast this with Jed. Jed had no experience, either professionally or honestly, at life in general, and was in fact the target of the moniker Bunk Bed Jed for the fact that he still shared a bunk bed with one of his brothers. He was also accepting big donations from a shady rogue millionaire named Ross Little, and also decided that calling the working mom slash teacher slash PhD candidate a sexist nickname like Princess was a good campaign strategy. And as you probably expect by now, he was beaten decisively. But it's even worse than it looks. He got beaten in a neon red district, in a neon red state, by a Democratic incumbent who likely would have lost to anyone who wasn't him just based on the demographics of the region alone. This loss wasn't just bad, it was cartoonishly bad. Furthermore, this loss by Jed is indicative of an even broader and more hilarious political failure, not just by him, but his entire family at large. See, you remember how I said that Arkansas used to be a Democratic stronghold? And you know how it's definitely not a Democratic stronghold now? Well, it turns out the story behind that change is even more incredible than you might think. This from Mark Carter at Arkansas Money and Politics. Though the 2010 midterms ushered in a briefly purple General Assembly, Republicans claimed the state legislature outright in 2012 and haven't looked back. Perry believes prior was the real test that the hard fall of an Arkansas brand as strong as the prior name signaled true regime change, and it was as quick and definitive as any she could find. Perry tells Arkansas Money and Politics that she wondered if Arkansas's political switch indeed was the quickest, so she resolved to find out. The Arkansas poll is a member of the National Network of State Polls, so Perry, her colleagues, and students have access to a treasure trove of political data. The reason we did it is because so many of us were talking back in 2010 and 2012 about how fast and thoroughly Arkansas was changing its stripes. We can say confidently that politically, Arkansas did change the most thoroughly and the fastest of any state for which we had data. The flip-flop was complete by 2014. The hue of the state legislature had turned from navy blue to crimson, or perhaps more appropriately for Arkansas, cardinal, roughly 75% Democrat to 75% Republican in just three election cycles. So just to be clear, 
even in a period where everything should have gone right for these guys, Josh and Jed were either just too gross, too inept, or too all of the above to succeed even when all of their gross conservative peers were raking in the success. And speaking of modern Arkansas, we probably ought to check in with our two main characters before we wrap this whole thing up. Let's take just a quick look at the gyms post-2020 before I give you my final thoughts. So as some of you may know by now, Jim Bob Duggar made a shocking return back to electoral politics in 2021, tossing his hat into the ring for the special election for the Arkansas State Senate 7th District seat that was vacated by the resigning Lance Eads. This truly may not have been that shocking of a development, what with Jim Bob's known relentless craving for attention. But the fact that this whole thing was both announced and hastily thrown together right in the middle of Josh Duggar's investigation on charges of possessing CSAM materials, well, that definitely puts the whole thing in a new light. And in general, Jim Bob's motivations for this run are murky as hell even today. He didn't advertise well or much at all, quite frankly. He lost really badly, coming in a distant third place. And basically, this whole event was never referenced once it was over. So why the hell was this decision even made? Well, as a guy who has spent the last two weeks of his life nose deep in Arkansas and Duggar electoral drama, I have a theory. I truly believe that this was nothing more than a hasty decision made by a flailing Jim Bob to try and ultimately unsuccessfully distract from his familial downfall. Nothing throws people off the scent of your past misdeeds like a bunch of new Google searches relating to the weird shit you're doing today. But it kind of worked, at least from my perspective. Researching any of Jim Bob's political life was made much more difficult by his run in this race in particular, since all of the tabloids were eating it up and posting about a thousand articles a day, which all made their way to Google. Luckily, I know all of the search engine tricks that help you bypass some of that stuff, but to someone without those skills, it might legitimately be impossible to look up Jim Bob's activities before a certain date. But really, the most interesting story here since 2020 has likely been the Jim and Bobby Holt revenge tour. Since 2021, these two have been out for Duggar blood, actively recounting the story of Josh's crimes and inappropriate behaviors from 2002 to 2003, and essentially throwing the Duggar parents, at least, under the bus at any turn they could. It started with Bobby's testimony at Josh's 2021 CSAM trial. She testified about the behaviors of Josh that she had been informed of in 2003, bravely taking a stand against the abuse factory that was the Duggars' home. Jim Bob, for his part, would deviously try to get her testimony thrown out under, I kid you not, clerical privilege, citing that since they were both members of the same church at that time, that he was speaking to her as a religious authority. Let's hear a little bit more about that from Adam Roberts at Arkansas's local 4029 TV station. The defense had opposed letting Holt testify. They argued that Holt was acting as part of a church group when Duggar confessed to her and that her testimony should have been prohibited due to Arkansas law on clergy privilege. The prosecution successfully argued that Holt was acting as a family friend and was not a priest in her religion. Now, even while this stunt obviously didn't work, it's still just particularly rage-inducing. Since the Duggars' religious beliefs clearly do not allow them to respect the authority of women in the church, I guess at least until it becomes a convenient legal technicality. I also get the sense that this was the last nail in the coffin of Bobby's goodwill. Following the trial, Bobby and Jim took to the aforementioned Sojo Files podcast and gave a full, shocking rundown of all that had transpired between them and the Duggars. Notably, listening to the podcast, I'll tell you, one can sense that Bobby is ready to burn the world down, offering more specific details than Jim consistently throughout the podcast, and even going back to name people he had tried to keep anonymous. And to bring this whole thing as full circle as I possibly can, this development culminated in the June 2023 release of Shiny Happy People wherein the Holts took their grievances and rage with the Duggars to the largest possible platform they could find. The fact that Jim Bob didn't even make it halfway through the debut of the first episode before releasing his public statement, that should tell you a lot about how explosive what's in that documentary actually is. And 
before we reach our conclusion in a development so recent that I almost didn't even get to include it in this episode, it appears we may yet be getting a real story of liberation out of all this. April of 2023 saw both Bobby and her son receive temporary orders of protection against Jim Holt. And on June 3rd, just one day after the release of Shiny Happy People, a judge in Arkansas not only made that order of protection permanent, but increased its duration to a full decade. For perspective, 10 years is the longest possible amount of time a judge in the state can give for an order of protection. Now, of course, I don't know what happened. And I doubt that anyone's going to be talking much about it for a while. But one way or another, I hope Bobby and her son are safe. And fundamentally, I am always happy to hear when someone escapes either an abusive religion or an abusive marriage. And so with that, let's move to my final thoughts. The story of Jim Holt Jim Bob, and their mutually brief but consequential run near the top of Arkansas politics is a story of many, many layers. It is, of course, a story of horrendous victimization and of terrible crimes perpetrated not just in plain sight, but right under the nose of far too many camera crews and disinterested grifters. It is also a personal story of lifelong friends torn apart by awful tragedy, duplicitous backstabbing, and a disgusting lack of regard for the bodily autonomy of women and children. For what it's worth, I do believe that that is the most important version of this story. It is also the story that Shiny Happy People tells better than I ever could hope to. And honestly, I think better than anyone has ever told it before. I'm really not directing you all to this series just because of my wife's involvement. I'm directing you to it because it tells the right stories, it platforms the right people, and it puts the entire abusive IBLP system under a hot, cleansing spotlight like nothing ever has before. Even so, there is more to be found here. This is also, if one is inclined to believe and think about it this way, a firm reminder of the biblical story of Joshua and the lessons one is supposed to take from it. Where the Bible showed us a story of sin and redemption, of one man swallowed up by greed and avarice, and of him being cast from the life of a pious and blessed friend so that his sin may not taint the other's glory. But with Jim Bob and Jim Holt, we see instead what would have happened if Joshua had decided, instead of turning to God, to instead lean on his worldly relationship with Achan, and to tacitly support a friend through even the most grievous and awful of sins. To maintain a friendship he should have killed off years before. And I think we all know how a biblical tale like that might end. But at the end of the day, this is still, at its heart, a Fundy Friday's episode starring King James. So, one can comfortably assume that it is also a tale of political intrigue and curiosity. It's a story of two men, two extreme religious hardliners and misogynists, getting far too close to the very top of state, and at one point even American politics, and bringing a whole host of their own toxicity along for the ride. Jim Bob, as a political candidate, at least in my mind, was always destined to fail, and is lucky to have won anything at all, truly. He was, and still is, likely a man motivated almost entirely by hubris. Drunk on so many years of IBLP seminars telling him he's the king of his home, his family, and his universe. Megalomania has woven itself so deep into Jim Bob's DNA at this point that I'm not sure he's capable of anything other than complete self-involvement. This man thinks he can just do what he wants, be who he wants, and that no one can stop him because he permanently has God on his side. His promotion of his son's works, along with that disastrous 2021 Senate run, should tell you everything you need to know about Jim Bob's ineptitude. Jim Holt, though, in another life, 
I think he could have been a major player in Arkansas politics. And at least for a civics geek like me, that's a story worth telling and paying attention to all on its own. His military experience alone should have carried him much farther than it did. And even though his legislative career was relatively brief, he just kind of seemed like the guy who would make the jump to higher office. Sure, he wasn't the most qualified candidate. He's not even a good person. He is, at best, an underachieving white man who never deserved public office, and at worst he seems to be a violent, sexist buffoon with a terminally weak moral compass. But Holt's steady and ambitious rise to power from 2000 to 2006, the races he got himself into, they tell the story of a man whose state was ready for what he had to offer. I don't think it's unreasonable to assume that there might be a version of this story where he did take down Blanche Lincoln. Remember, he was only six points away. Of course, it's not like the Christian nationalists and the evangelicals don't already have some senators in their pocket. As far as I know, Ted Cruz and Josh Hawley still have jobs, at least at the time of recording, and it doesn't seem like that's going to change anytime soon. I'm not here to claim that Washington or Arkansas would have been completely different had Holt won that election, but I do think he would have found his own unique way to get into that office and make things much, much worse. And so, as we finish out here, Let's take from this story what we can. Both of these men are case studies in just how far individuals of patently low character, achievement, and ability can get if they're willing to align themselves with the evangelical church and the moneyed interests behind it. While I'm sure most of all of you watching this are aware of that fact, this story is still a clear picture of the process in action, and if you're like me, Watching it all play out line by line kind of leaves you with a little feeling of existential dread. We need to be aware of just how close we were to a U.S. Senator Jim Holt, and how we're still as vulnerable as we've ever been to these kinds of candidates. Because now, more than ever, it seems like those who are willing to pander to the most vitriolic and fringe parts of the conservative voter base are in a remarkable place to achieve political glory and then take to that office with a vendetta of regression. We've already explored men on this channel like Madison Cawthorn and George Santos, and both of them played this same angle to a T. Do we really think either of those two were smarter or more capable than the gyms? So I guess at the very end of all of this, the point is that it's always good and relevant and important to speak out if a candidate in your area is just patently underqualified, underprincipled, or just shitty. We can draw a direct line from the careers of Jim Holt and Jim Bob Duggar to the detritus that has been allowed to walk the hallowed halls of our government in a post-Trump era. Some candidates are worth ending friendships for. Some candidates are worth going to protests for. Some candidates are worth actively giving of your time and resources to stop. And you're smart. You will know them when you see them. You will know when the sin needs to be purged from the camp. And all I ask is that you make sure you act when the time is right. Whew, all right, that's the end of that one. I have been filming for four hours. I am purple right now, probably because it was daylight when I started and now it's dark. I'm also supposed to go cook Jen a coconut curry because I promised her, so I'm gonna get to that too. Um, I'm gonna keep this quick. Um, it has been an absolute madhouse uh, recently around here. Um, what with Shiny Happy People's release and all of the flurry going around on that. Um, thank you all so much for just being so kind and sweet and keeping us grounded. Um, it's It's been incredible and we're reminded every day, not only of the fact that you put Jen in that position, but also that um, you all are, are still here and still supporting us and, and enjoying the work we do. And we <laughs> we never feel worthy, but it always means the world to us. In the meantime, if you are new to this channel because of Shiny Happy People, welcome. Thank you so much for taking time to sit down and watch one of my videos. Uh, I'm King James. I'm Jen's husband. You didn't see me in the movie, but um, I'm around here, and uh, I'm real glad you found something I made. That's that's so cool. Oh, man. It's so cool. Um, 
If you'd like to support the channel, we have an active Patreon that'll be linked down below, along with our bonfire store where we sell merch, t-shirts, mugs, posters, stickers now. Um, we got all kinds of stuff. Stickers, real quick, I want to let everyone know, we were, we we gave out a little bit of misinformation. We didn't mean to. We're very sorry. Uh, apparently, right now, the stickers are uh, $4.99 plus $4.99 shipping per sticker, unless you buy multiples of the same sticker, I think is how it goes. We wanted to let you all know that, uh, just so you could... Um, purchase wisely we didn't want somebody to get a basket full of stickers and then watch the price double up that sucks um in the meantime though um just <laughs> thank you all so much like i said this has been a whirlwind um we are getting back to our old way of doing things we're getting back to um making the fundy fridays episodes you all know and love the way you love them with the formatting and and how we do stuff this is what we want to do we loved working on shiny happy people we love everybody involved in that but um man it feels really good to get back to uh doing things the way we do them so um thank you for putting up with my pretty purple face and i will see you all next time all the love in the world from the king and the rev take care and thank you for everything <laughs>